Well, hello again. Uh, my name is Adrian Gilbert. Uh, in case you haven't come across this channel before, uh, I'm going to tell you things today which uh, you probably never ever heard before. You maybe even never even thought about this question, which is, who was Saint John of the Apocalypse? You heard of the Apocalypse? Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Last book in the Bible. Uh, really weird book, I have to say, and I'm doing a series of lectures on this. But today I want to talk to you about exactly who was the author, because I think that's rather important. Now, before I go on any further, um, if you haven't uh, already subscribed to this channel, please do. Yes, 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 I know everyone says this. Press the little bell and the button. <laughs> it's really tiresome, isn't it? But it does help people like me who are trying to build a channel if uh, if it's seen by YouTube that it's getting support it helps to boost the amount of visibility that channel's given so I'm asking you this as uh, a favor to me and I'm very grateful if you do and if you like the video please press the like as well I mean it, <laughs> if you don't like it well don't bother but uh, anyway if you can help me in that way I'd be very grateful now, as you probably guess, if you haven't already, if you don't already know, I'm British, right? English, to be precise. And I'm going to make a confession to you. Uh, we English, we have a tendency to be kind of uh, very legalistic and cynical about things. And that gives rise to this peculiar sense of humour we have, a sort of self-deprecating sense of humour that uh, gives rise to the kind of Monty Python type things. Uh, it's, a, it's a trait of ours. But on the other hand, there's a negative side to that, and that is that we tend not to take things on, on just on word. Uh, we like proof for everything. We're very much Doubting Thomas sort of people. Yeah, you say you're the Christ, well, let me put my fingers in the side and see, make sure there is a hole there. Um, I'm afraid, and I confess, that the British are very like that. And because of that, we have tended to lose faith with Christianity in particular. Uh, we say, ah, oh, well, science is what you need. Science, science, science. You know, evolution, Darwin. I'm going to go into Darwin, by the way, and I'm going to crucify him. <laughs> but that's another time. Um, so... Let's find some evidence and see if we can turn things around a bit. Because you see, the tendency, if you're British, and I think this actually applies to Germans as well, because we've actually got a lot more in common with the Germans than we often like to admit. Um, let's look at this, because the, the tendency is to say, well, yeah, the Revelations, it says it's written by someone called John, and he's on this island of Patmos, but... Who do we know who he is? He's just a bod. You know, someone who wrote a book. Not, you know, his Greek's not very good. Um, to say that he's the, the, the John who was the disciple of Jesus, well, that's stretching a point, isn't it? You can't prove it. Um, he's just some other Christian. Perhaps he was a pastor of some sort out there. And he wrote his book and somehow it was circulated and it found its way into the Bible. Well, if you're a cynic, and that's a very English way of looking at things, you might say, well, yeah, we can't prove anything other than that, so we just have to accept that. Well, I think you can prove it. At least you can give a judgment as you would present evidence in a court of law, and you'll give a judgment based on probability. And that's what I'm going to do today. And I'm going to um, give you evidence that you might find very surprising um, that links this John with an Old Testament figure. But I'll go into that later. So we have the story of um, St. Saint, Saint John uh, who wrote the Revelation and he's living on an island called Patmos and we're told that he was exiled there. Now it doesn't actually say he's exiled in the Apocalypse itself, it just says he was there. Uh, people assumed that he was exiled, and 
I'm not going to argue with that because I haven't weighed the evidence on it. So let's accept that he was exiled there. And he has a vision. And in this vision, this divine personage appears to him. He calls the, the first and the last, um, the Alpha and the Omega. Actually, I have a picture. Where have I put it? Of the Alpha and the Omega. Yes, I have a picture. I hope you can see it clearly. Um, this was painted for me as a commission. And it was painted for me by my old friend Bengt Alfredson, who passed away a couple of years ago now, um, for my book, Signs in the Sky. So in this picture, here is St. John. Corner here. And he's having a vision of this divine Christ-like figure, the first and the last, and the first and the last tells him to write down in a book everything that he sees and he's shown, and that book is the book we now call the Apocalypse or the Book of Revelation. They painted this for me. It's actually got a lot of other symbolism in it, which I will probably explain at some time in the future. That's all I want to show you for now, that this Christ-like figure is dictating to St. John the book. <coughs> so, John receives all these images, and the church, when it was putting together which book should go into the Bible, there were a number of people that had apocalyptic type writings of based based on visions and most most well all of the others were left out but this one was put in because it was believed that it was divinely inspired <clears throat> so we're going to go i'm going to sort of present you the evidence that i think that john that we talked about in uh, this is actually the apostle john who was the youngest of the apostles and at the time of the revelation, which is believed to have been during the persecutions of Domitian, who was a, a, a Roman emperor, the younger son of, uh, who was it, Vespasian. Um, and uh, he uh, took over from Vespasian's older son. What was his name? Uh, it's gone out of my head. It doesn't matter anyway. But anyway, it'd be around about the late first century, maybe around 90 AD. And you think, well, Jesus was crucified around about 30 AD. So that's 60 years later. And you think, oh my God, you know, would he still be around? Well, yes, because John was a very young man at the time of Jesus. Uh, he was possibly only about 20 at the time of the crucifixion, maybe even younger. Um, so it's quite possible that he was an old man in his 80s um, at the time when this revelation was being given. And actually, he's the only one of the apostles who survived, uh, that, that was not um, martyred um, during the course of his life. So he survived, and, and as far as we know, he died peacefully. So that makes him unique as well. Now, how did he come into the story? Well, just let me put my glasses on. Um, as the story is told in the Matthew Gospel, curiously, John doesn't include the story of his... He's very bashful in his own Gospel about himself. He doesn't even mention himself by name. Um, but he's in the Matthew Gospel, and it tells us um, the story about... Jesus, when he's recruiting his apostles, um, and he's get, he goes to this place called Capernaum. Now, I've been there, and it's on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, or 
Lake Tiberius, or I think they call it uh, Genezaret or something these days, Lake Genezaret, something like that. But then you see of Galilee, and it is a town called Capernaum, and Jesus uh, calls some of his apostles when he's there. And it goes here, this is in Matthew chapter 4, and I've had complaints that I didn't give the <laughs> chapter and verse when I was reading from the Bible. So chapter 4, and it's verse 18, it starts, and it goes to verse 27. If you want to look it up. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called to them. Immediately, immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So these were going to become Jesus' core apostles. And you have to ask yourself, well, how come you know, he goes to Capernaum and he, he recruits these fishermen, simple fishermen, um, <clears throat> and they become his core apostles? There's Peter, there's Andrew, his brother, and there's James and John. Now, three of these, Peter, James, and John, are the key apostles when Jesus is going you know, doing certain things they witness some of his core miracles when he keeps everybody else outside and they also are the only ones who witness what's called the transfiguration when Jesus goes up on the mountain it's believed to be Mount Tabor and he is transfigured he shows himself in his spirit form and and the spirit forms of Elijah, Elijah and Moses appear alongside him. And they witness that. So these are his, his, uh, his inner core of apostles. You've got the twelve and then you have the three within, within the twelve. Who he explains things to more than he does to the others. So you have a hierarchy of explanations. There's the multitude who gather around feeding 5,000 etc. And he gives them... Uh, lectures in the form of parables and you know and th those are all recorded in the Bible of course and you can read those and study them and, and ponder them then we're told he took his apostles aside and quite often he would explain what the parable really meant and you have some of those commentaries then at other times he takes his three away with him and you don't get told what he told them except you get in John's Gospel which is the most mystical of the three, you get the whole teaching about the Logos. And I'm going to do another program on that. might be quite a long one, I don't know. But um, he gives the Logos teachings, which are based on the first uh, chapter of the John Gospel. And if you understand what that's all about, you can begin to understand what is said later on in that Gospel, which makes no sense if you don't understand where he's coming from. So John was a very mystical figure. And we can imagine that even as a young man, he was quite clairvoyant. Certainly, he was certainly shown a lot. And he's referred to um, as Jesus' favorite, the one that he loved. And he's the one that was sitting next to Jesus at the, um, the Last Supper. And it's said to have leaned against Jesus when Jesus was saying that he was going to hand out a piece of bread dipped in wine and give it to the one who's going to betray him. And he gives it to Judas Iscariot, who goes off and the devil enters into him. We're told all that. It's all in the Bible. So, skeptical English that I am, I can see that this Apostle John is kind of special um, in the Bible. He's one of the, the early recruits. He's one of the three that are shown things. 
And by the time the, um, the apocalypse is being written, he's the only one still alive. And in that case, he's the only one, the only person still alive who was one of Jesus' apostles who actually walked with him. So that kind of gives him a special, special ranking. Um, if he was just some bod called John living on the island of Patmos, well, yeah, you could still say the apocalypse is interesting. But if you think and understand that it's almost certain we're talking about the same John, then that gives a much more authority to the apocalypse. Now, one of the, the arguments that's used against this, I told you that we have to treat this like a court of law. One of the arguments that's used against this is that the, the apocalypse is written in quite poor quality Greek compared with the gospel and the epistles of John. John wrote a couple of epistles as well. So they say, ah, well, you know, the John who was writing his gospel and writing epistles, a much more educated man, you know. Um, this apocalypse, yeah, this guy, he, he doesn't know his Greek very well. So they can't be the same person. Well, I'll turn that round. Um, John, the fisherman, probably never went to school. <laughs> if he did, he might have only been taught basic sort of reading and writing, maybe not even that. He's out there fishing. Right? He gets called, come along with me. But he may well have spoken some Greek. But the, the language of, of Galilee, of the northern part of what's now Israel, um, they would have spoken Aramaic. Jesus' natural language would be Aramaic, which is the language of Syria. Um, Padam Aram uh, in the Bible is the area around um, uh, Haran, which is just south of Edessa, or what's now called San Liufa, which is in Turkey, and just over the border. But it's actually within Turkey now, Haran, but that area and, and that part of Syria is, is called Padam Aram. And that's where Abraham came from. Abraham, now you're, you're told by the archaeologists who should know better that Abraham came from Ur down there in Mesopotamia. He didn't. That's, <laughs> he didn't. He came from Ur of the Chaldees, it tells us in the Bible. And the Chaldeans lived in northern Mesopotamia in what is now Turkey. And Ur of the Chaldees is the place called Urchai, which we, it was then called um, Edessa by the Greeks and um, is now called uh, Urfa or Sandli Urfa by the Turks. A very ancient city and I, I think they now, it's, it's right near there that you've got Gebe Gebekli Tepe, which is the oldest um, structural buildings seen on earth or has been discovered so far. I think it goes back to 9,500 BC and it's almost certain that it's, um, Edessa uh, Orpha was just as old. Um, and if you go there now, this is a bit of a digression, but I'll just pop this in. If you go there now, and I've been there, um, they have caves there where there are springs of water feeding fish ponds. And there's a legend there that that's where Abraham was born. And for the Muslim people who live there, they go and worship in those caves. And there's a story about how Abraham was tied up between the two pillars. There's two big pillars there on top of the, what is the fortress area. And he was tied between these pillars and and the, the, the wicked king, Nimrod, was going to push him off the top and, and to his death. Um, but with the earth opened and these ponds appeared and Abraham splashed down in the ponds and so he was, his life was saved. Well, this is all, I think, to do with the constellation of Orion and it's reflection in the ponds when it crossed the south meridian um, in the sky and, and you could see the reflection in the ponds. It's a whole other subject but this is the connection between Edessa and the Abraham legend and then Abraham's cast out of Edessa and down the road 40 kilometers or so is where Haran is and that's where he then went and where um, uh, uh, his brother settled, his brother Haran, and then Abraham went on to Canaan, the promised land. Later on, um, 
Isaac is born and he goes back to Haran to find a wife and then later on they have a child Jacob who goes back again and he meets um, Rebecca, uh, it's not Rebecca, Rebecca's his mother, um, Rachel, um, he wants to marry Rachel but he has to marry the elder sister first. That's all in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. So we have this Aramaic which was the language spoken around there and then they took it with them to the Holy Land. So that would be one language that John would be speaking. Uh, but he very likely spoke Greek as well. People were mu often multilingual and Greek was the lingua franca of the Eastern Roman Empire uh, and continued to be right up until the fall of Constantinople. Uh, they, people continued to speak Greek. So John would very likely have spoken Greek, probably didn't write it very well. And the Greek that he knew was uh, probably a sort of vernacular, not very grammatically correct. Uh, you can imagine sort of a, a working class lad from Britain who's not had much education and then he's got to write uh, a book and his, his vocabulary is not fantastic, especially writing in French. <laughs> so um, this is kind of the, the reality. Now with the gospel and the epistles of John, he would have had help, you know. He would have had followers, he would have had people who were Greek scholars and he would say, right, I've written, I've written my gospel. Can you, can you go help me clear, clear up the grammar and get the syntax right, please? And they would have done that for him. And the same with his letters. He'd say, look, you know, I've done my best. I've written the letter and I'm going to send it out. But can you get the grammar right for me? But with the revelation, he actually tells us. If I, let's see if I can find it here. It's right at the, right at the end. Um, uh, Yeah, he writes here, this is the second, or this is verse 18 of the last chapter, and there's only 21 chapters, right? Uh, verses. He says, I warn everyone uh, who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from them, from the words of the, of the book of this prophecy. God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So you're not allowed to change it. <laughs> so whatever John wrote, that's, that's what he wrote. Nobody's going to change it. No, not a jot or tittle. It's going to be changed. So we can understand why it's that the Greek there is not as good as the Greek in the Gospel. Uh, it's because this is his vernacular that he was writing, and he, he's not, it's not allowed to, and nobody's going to dare to change it. Uh, it. It goes in there, everything. So I think that is fairly good evidence um, for John being the real author of that book. But there's more. Um, and John, the, 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 the revelation itself actually refers back a lot to the teachings in another book called Daniel, the prophet, prophecies of Daniel. And again, that is going to be subject of other lectures. It's, it's a very big subject in itself. And I, I will have to refer to it somewhat for these lectures on, on the revelation, but um, it deserves, deserves a lot of work in itself. And Daniel has this vision himself of this being uh, that appears to him, that uh, he describes it. If I can find it. I'm going to let you look for that yourself because I haven't got it marked here. But he describes this great angelic presence, and it's very similar to the description. It's exactly the same, word for word, as you get in the John Gospel, where he speaks of the first and the last. The Jesus that appears to John and uh, dictates the revelation to him. Daniel's already met this figure, 
And Daniel is shown certain prophecies relating to the end of time, but only a little bit. And there's a book, and there's a closed book, and he's told that this is not for your time. It'll be at the end, and you'll be there. But for now, this is closed. Well, when you go into the Revelation, the whole Revelation is about the opening of that book. It's the opening of seven seals. Now, I'm going to finish this lecture by pointing out to something I believe. Now, when, when you're looking at uh, certain personages in the Bible, it's very clear that they have their echoes. Uh, John the Baptist, and I've written this in at least one of my books, I believe to be the actual reincarnation of Elijah. John the Baptist, you know, was uh, preparing the way for the Messiah. And there's the prophecies in the Bible that Elijah would be sent ahead of him to prepare the way. And Christians believe that this was John the Baptist. And Jesus says in the Bible that uh, his gospel say, well, who, who was John the Baptist? And he says, you know, he was Elijah. And he gives that, he explains that in the Bible, and you will find it there. Um, well, if John the Baptist can be the reincarnation of Elijah, and it's actually even more interesting than that, one of the things that Elijah did was he prophesied against uh, Ahab and Jezebel, the king and queen of Galilee at that time, um, of what was northern Israel. And then when John the Baptist is around, he falls out with the local king and queen of, of that same area, Galilee, uh, who's Herod Antipas and his wife Herodias. And you know the story of Herodias hated his guts, hated John, and get, gets Herod drunk. And Herod loves the dancing of Salome, who's Herodias' daughter, lusts after her does the dance of seven veils and he promises her anything she wants and her mother said well I want tell him that you want the head of John the Baptist so John's head is cut off brought to her on a plate so why was that done well I think it was revenge for um, Elijah uh, putting a curse on Jezebel <laughs> she's thrown out of a window and she's not allowed to be buried, and the dogs eat her. So Jezebel gets her own back when she reincarnates as Herodias. So there's a whole karmic connection there. You've probably never been told that before, um, but there is a karmic connection between John as a liar and Jezebel and Herodias. Incidentally, I think Jezebel's back in the flesh now. I'm not going to tell you who she is, but you, you know her. <laughs> That's my opinion. I'm not going to say any more because I don't want to be dragged before the courts and sued for libel or something. But um, people do reincarnate. You've probably been here before. I've been here before. I know a couple of my previous lives. And there's plenty of evidence if you search around on, on the internet of kids who can tell you everything about what happened to them before and how they were this person and, and he was shot or whatever. And then they go and meet the previous family and they recognize them and can tell them. So reincarnation is a reality, in my opinion. And if that's so, who was John? Well, I'll tell you who I think he was. I think he was Daniel. And when Jesus came along, calling his disciples, yes, they might have been fishermen, but he knew the souls that were actually incarnate. 